We have been taught well in this great conference, my brothers and sisters. And I have been thinking a great deal about teaching and great teachers. Last evening, Elder Marion D. Hanks brought to our attention the situation concerning his departed cousin recently, a brother frame who had a deep impact on humanity. He mentioned that one of the great tributes play, paid at his funeral was that every boy should have a brother frame in his life. I've thought about that and thank God repeatedly sends for one such individual. Mine was in the form of a 78-year-old man who was assigned to be a priest advisor some years ago to six of us who were in our struggling teens, challenged with the future. He was Brother Charles B. Stewart. His son is here today as president of the great Tabernacle Choir. I don't know what you think about a 78-year-old man when you're 16, but to some of us, we questioned the wisdom of our bishop, for we thought he had literally brought Moses back. <laughs> I remember the first day I reported to my class in that rickety old upper story room of Hollywood Ward, and there was greeted by this kind man. He took me by the hand as he had the other boys and said, you're Harold Dunn, son, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. He talked a little bit about me, my family, and showed a great personal interest. And then he said, Paul, one of the requirements for being a member of this class is to think new thoughts. He says, do you have one this morning? <laughs> well, now I hadn't had a new thought in years. <laughs> and he could see my plight and he said, all right, I will teach you one. Listen carefully. Attention is the mother of memory. Now, can you repeat it back? And I tried and got it to him. He permitted me to enter. We had a great class. It ended as I went to leave. He said, I forgot to tell you, before you go home, you've got to give me another new thought. I thought I won't go home. <laughs> I didn't have one, and so he said, now listen very carefully, and I'll teach you one, and you'll always remember it. He said, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. I've never forgotten it. Another week went, and we went through a similar experience. I still didn't have a new thought. He said, listen very carefully. There's an odd little voice ever speaking within that prompts us to duty and warns us from sin. And what is most strange, it makes itself heard, though it gives not a sound and says never a word. And I've never forgotten it. I went to go home and still was short. And he said, listen carefully. He said, Paul, there was a wise old owl who sat in an oak, and the longer he sat, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Oh, Paul, why can't you be like that wise old bird? <laughs> and I thought a lot about that since. And another week, another great thought. He says, remember, young man, example sheds a genial ray which men are apt to borrow. So first improve yourself today and then your friends tomorrow. And I haven't forgotten that either. A time won't permit a number of others. And two years later, I found myself in the fighting forces of our great country. I was on the island of Okinawa. I received a letter from Mrs. Stewart. And it told me of the sad news that my kind friend, an advisor had departed. In it, she had attached 
a half-written letter from my advisor to me. And he says, Dear Paul, I've been thinking about you in that far-off country. I'm sure discouraged and depressed. And in order to build your spirit, I have included some additional gem thoughts. And I have never forgotten them. Thank God for people who care. I have since counted on my hand five such teachers who have influenced me for good. I would agree with Elder Hanks. There ought to be a Brother Stewart in every boy's life. What is a teacher? The teacher is a prophet. He lays the foundation of tomorrow. The teacher is an artist. He works with a precious clay of unfolding personality. The teacher is a friend. His heart responds to the faith and devotion of his students. The teacher is a citizen. He is selected and licensed for the improvement of society. The teacher is an interpreter. Out of his mature and wider life, he seeks to guide the young. The teacher is a builder. He works with the higher and finer values of civilization. The teacher is a cultural bearer. He leads the way toward tastes, saner attitudes, more gracious manners, higher intelligence. The teacher is a planner. He sees the young lives before him as a part of a great system which shall grow stronger in the light of truth. The teacher is a pioneer. He is always interpreting and attempting the impossible and usually winning out. The teacher is a reformer. He seeks to improve the handicaps that weaken and destroy life. The teacher is a believer. He has an abiding faith in God and in the improvability of the race. Someone has said there are obviously two kinds of educations. One teaches us how to live. The other, how to make a living. We're engaged in teaching people how to live. Albert Hubbard said, you can't teach anybody anything. You can only help him find it within himself. The Savior had no peer as a teacher. For just a moment, uh, let me walk you through again the 15th chapter of Luke, where this great master teacher tells us how to solve problems facing all. Luke records that there drew near him a great multitude, the publicans, the sinners, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And he spake unto them this parable, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine, and go after the one which is lost? And then he tells about the rejoicing moment when he's found. And then he doesn't even pause. He goes into a second parable, like unto it. He says, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house until she finds it. And she too rejoices with her neighbors. And then he goes into that great parable of all time, the prodigal son. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of thy goods that falleth to me. And we recognize how he, with his agency, squandered it all. I used to wonder, as a teacher so-called, why the Savior would spend three parables so quickly about things that get lost. And then one day it dawned. People do get lost in various ways. And here in this great chapter of Luke, we find the Savior counseling how to recover. Uh, permit me this observation. The Savior might say today, through his leaders here, that those of us who might fall into the sheep category are not maybe basically sinners by nature or even choice, 
but who, like sheep, get confused in our values. And I'm sure the Savior would say to the teacher in the classroom, to the advisor, if you want to retrieve this person, put a higher value in its place. He's talking now about lost coins. This whole conference has been filled with precious coins that become lost. Young people, if you please. And there are those of us who are the responsible agents who, like the woman of this great teaching parable, let that priceless gem slip through our fingers. Certainly, we wouldn't recover that kind of a lost article the way we would a sheep. He would say that love and care and attention would be paramount. And then the great parable of the prodigal son. And the Savior saying that there are those who get lost by choice. And that, in the concluding of that statement, he says, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants doth my father have with enough bread to spare? There are those who get lost because their agency takes them down that path. We can't do a lot at some points to recover that kind of a person except to open our arms and our church doors and to let them know they are wanted. The teachers and advisors are needed. Let me just say as a concluding <laughs> thought that this is a positive gospel. We ought to be the happiest people in the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a great building force. It teaches men to be happy and to always wear a smile. But sometimes we neglect the simple things that mean the most. Most people in the rush of modern life never know real friendship and the warmth that the gospel and even a smile can bring. An acquaintance of mine recently said to me as we walked down the street and noticed a man with a sour face, he looks like he was weaned on lemon juice and a dill pickle. <laughs> I also heard about a mother and her young daughter who were listening to a public speaker when the child said to her mother, isn't that man happy? The mother replied, I guess so. To which the girl remarked, why doesn't he tell his face? <laughs> I think our Heavenly Father would be most disappointed if he saw the expressions of some of us who have all that the world contain and fail to incorporate it in our lives and share it with others. The meaning and purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ to me is that it brings joy and happiness and peace and contentment. We all have problems. The world is sick with problems. And yet in these sacred words are the solutions to the problem. If we could encourage the world to know the word of God. There are 43 other parables which teach how to find and help people. My testimony is that it's true and that it works. I gave a beggar from my store of wealth some gold. He spent the shining ore and came again, and yet again, still cold and hungry as before. I gave a thought, and through the thought of mine, he found himself the man supreme divine, fed, clothed, and crowned with blessings manifold, and now he begs no more. Such is the gospel of Jesus Christ, to which I bear solemn testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.